Hey there. Did you know this channel is 10 years old now? That's kind of insane. I may not have the biggest audience or the longest list of videos, but it's still pretty crazy to think about. It feels like just yesterday when I started making videos in my bedroom with a crappy Logitech headset I bought with my high school allowance. Cause yeah, I was 16 when I started making videos with my younger brother, and it wasn't until I was 20 that I made my first countdown that would eventually lead to me finding my passion for writing, so the occasion's pretty special for me. My first countdown on this channel was the fittingly titled Top 10 First Bosses, and while I have thought of remaking that old list for a special occasion such as this, outside of one, maybe two entries, my opinions on those old bosses haven't really changed. So instead, I'm gonna tackle this topic again Volume 2 style. I'll be going over even more of my favorite fights that are usually seen as the first major challenge in your adventure. So, I suppose with the context of the original video, you could call this the honorary top 20. I tell you to go watch the original video for more context, but uh, that was back when my keyframing looked like this. My audio sounded like this. There, that's more like it. Holy hell, where do I start with this one? And when I still used green text to, I don't know, stick with a theme, I guess? I am not changing that old thumbnail, though. That should be everybody's first warning sign. What was I saying? Right, right, right. Since that video hasn't aged very well quality-wise, why don't we just start with a quick little recap with updated thoughts where needed. Number 10 was Mirmalir from Skyrim. This is the one I would definitely take off the list today. I even go on to explain that Mirmalir may not even be your first boss depending on which quest line you pursue. I mostly picked him because of his importance in Skyrim's main storyline, and also because I just really like dragons. Dragon D's nuts. Number 9, Clanky Woods from Kirby Planet Robobot. When Planet Robobot came out, fighting a mechanized Wispy Woods with the, at the time, new and unique copy abilities was a ton of fun, and honestly, I still think it is. I love that his roots are drills too, that's clever. Number 8, Wizen from Asora's Wrath. An absolute spectacle. The quick time events really make you feel the impact of Asura's punches as you take down this planet-sized titan. I'd probably rank it higher today. Number 7, the Master of the Treetop Tower from Pandora's Tower. I've got a whole history of Pandora's Tower, and I'll always remember just how mystified I was, not only by this boss's design, but from the fact that he just ignores you like, yeah, whatever, come on in, just don't eat all my Oreos. Oh, you little fu- Number six was Ridley from Super Metroid, and I think I'd take this one off the list as well. It's a simple tutorial fight meant to teach you about combat and movement, but looking back, it really feels like I was stretching the definition of a boss fight, just so I could talk about Ridley. Number five was the Goma from The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. Another one for the nostalgia books, but swinging over this giant magma-coated centipede like some bizarre Indiana Jones spin-off makes for a very entertaining fight. Number four, the armored Maw Dad from Pikmin Free. A lot of similarities to Goma, actually. So I guess we could interchange the two, depending on if you feel like swinging mere inches over danger, or if you feel like throwing rocks at shit you probably shouldn't be throwing rocks at. Number 3, Metal Gear Ray from Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. You slice a giant robot in half. What more do you want me to say? Number 2, Daiko no Orochi from The Wonderful 101. You slice a giant robot in half. But with friends! It is also a dragon. And number 1, Metal Face from Xenoblade Chronicles. You want to get people invested in your game? Take notes from this. Flip the player's understanding of the lore and game mechanics on its head to teach them something new, and give them a reason to want to see the story through to the end. If you haven't played Xenoblade, this fight's still my number one, and for very good reason. Now that that's all been said and done, it's time to go galactic with 10 of my favorite first bosses once again. This first one is here purely for nostalgic reasons. I grew up with the Crash Bandicoot games and Tiny Tiger was one of my favorite characters. 
There's something about his upper body build and sharp teeth combined with his attire that gave him this menacing but overall goofy appearance. Look at him, don't you want to just scratch him behind his ears? In Crash Bandicoot Warped, however, he goes full-on gladiator, complete with armor and a trident to pierce the marsupial's skull, but he still keeps his favorite red sneakers. I suppose that's better than jumping around in traditional Roman sandals. Eventually, he'll go in for the kill, but if you're quick enough, his trident will get stuck in the ground. Now's your opportunity for the crowd pleaser! Are you not entertained?! Once you bruise Tiny's ego, he quickly jumps out of the arena and sends a pride of lions after you. It's actually pretty easy to be caught off guard and made their lunch if you didn't know they had slight homing properties. Or you could just stand in this corner. I love that the crowd throws cheese at you if you do this in the insane remake, and I mean, you kinda deserve it. They came here for a show and here you are... cheesing the fight. <laughs> wow, this really is a tough crowd. The rule of three is at play here, so just repeat the strategy, taking note of the increased jumps in lions, and Tiny is brought down to size. It doesn't sound like much, and frankly it isn't, but like I said, this is the obligatory nostalgia entry. And I'd like to believe that the presentation and simple execution is what helped it stand out in my mind so many years later. Well done, children. Okay, so I've only played the original Doom, like, super recently, and I kinda see why it's still so beloved. Despite being made for DOS, they managed to make a somewhat smooth and fast-paced experience. So if you can handle this digital gore, it's super satisfying to be shooting demons while knee-deep in the dead. Haha, <laughs> that's the name of the first episode! It's honestly really easy to just get lost in your power trip, until you're forced to meet your match against the Barons of Hell, that is. Seeing as up to this point you've been fighting off Hellspawn that could easily be taken down with one or two shotgun blasts, being trapped in an arena with not one, but two towering demons is a real test of skill. The Baron has 1000 HP, which is the equivalent of 5 rockets or 100 bullets. And that's just for one of these guys! Keep in mind that at this point in the game, there is no way to obtain the Plasma Rifle or BFG-9000. And if you play this level on the ultra-violent difficulty, there's a bunch of partially invisible demons running around, so you need to make every shot count. This is fun, I promise. <laughs> The Baron's fireballs are much faster than the average imp, so you really need to pay attention to be able to dodge them. You can use audio cues to determine when they're ready to attack you, but since there's two of these guys, you can easily be overwhelmed by both of their loud screams. Especially if you're wearing headphones. But, uh, pro tip, don't wear headphones when playing a DOS game. But this fight is a great example of how Doom is all about fast reflexes, quick thinking, and pattern recognition, and isn't just a shoot it till it dies game like that one infamous strategy guide quote suggests. Plus, Doom might be one of the first games to pull off one of my personal favorite game tropes, where the bosses appear later as normal enemies to show just how much stronger you've gotten since your first encounter with them. In full honesty though, the main thing that's keeping this fight lower on the list is the absolute mood whiplash you get at the end. After defeating the Barons, you enter a portal that takes you straight to hell, but before you can fight back against whatever's surrounding you, you get… a message from the developers? You're supposed to win, aren't you? What the hell is this? It's not supposed to end this way. To continue the Doom experience, play the Shores of Hell and its amazing sequel, Inferno. <laughs> Did I just get trolled by John Romero? God damn it, I mean, yeah, I'm gonna play it because Doom's awesome, but come on, dude, why you gotta word it that way? The common boss fight we see quite a bit is the idea of taking a regular enemy and making it bigger. You know what I'm talking about, the giant Goomba and New Super Mario Bros, legendary enemies in Fallout, and even RPG enemies like the Tomberry King from Final Fantasy. Or Totem Pokemon from Sun and Moon. This type of boss gets a lot of flack, mainly because it's mostly just a bigger normal enemy with more health and 
No major changes to their AI, making them just another mook to kill with no real change in strategy. My personal favorite example of this is the Maneater in Castlevania Aria of Sorrow, cause like, he's not even a boss in the main game, they just stuck him into the boss rush mode for no explained reason, like seriously, why are you here? <laughs> When done with actual creativity, however, we can get some fun and memorable bosses, like those in Yoshi's Island or the Poe King in Zelda Wind Waker. And speaking of Legend of Zelda, oh my kid, you probably know where this is going. The Big Green Choo Choo or Oversized Choo Choo are both pretty misleading names because it's not actually any bigger than an average Choo Choo. It only seems that way because you had to shrink down to an ant's size just to get here. And I love how the game reminds you of this by showing the choo-choo in the overworld just kind of stumbling onto your location. The choo-choo basically just hops around in an attempt to crush you, and you've got to make it lose its balance by sucking up its jelly base into your gust jar. Yeah, it's super simple, arguably more than the tiny tiger fight. But you know how much I love a good scaled boss fight, and the fact that your first big challenge is one of the weakest enemies in Zelda that's technically only tougher because you're now flea-sized is admittedly kind of funny. You know, I've always been curious, that jelly is actually the base for potions, right? So couldn't Link theoretically just scrape that jelly out of the jar and make a profit? Or is it like a black hole kind of thing and some astral deity is spraying it on their toast? Only the important questions on this channel. I always thought this was just stupid. <laughs> You're telling me that not only is Dante back to his old edgy self, but that this equally edgy kid is able to fight him off with just one arm? You got a jacked up notion of fair play, pal. And it's beginning to piss me off. Like, come on, dude, give Dante some respect. But to be fair, it isn't long after the tutorial fight when he's back to the fun-loving guy we all love. And I guess if you're going to introduce a new protagonist, having them prove their strength by taking on a veteran of the series is a pretty good concept. Especially when you've got them using all their signature weapons. Ebony and Ivory, the iconic stinger attack from Rebellion, even does his dumbass taunts. While I'd personally prefer the game teach me Nero's moves in a less forced fashion, I can't deny that putting those moves to the test against the OG Demon Hunter himself makes for a really entertaining fight. And of course, the fight ends with Dante getting impaled. Because it just isn't a Devil May Cry game unless Dante gets a sword through his chest. God, I love this stupid ass series. Hey! Adios, kid. Kingdom Hearts is a series I often refer to as a shonen anime wet dream, and you've got the boss fights from the second game to thank for that. They're flashy, over the top, and just a whole lot of fun. When I made my original first bosses list all those years ago, a surprising amount of people were wondering why I didn't pick the fight against Axel in Kingdom Hearts 2. Well, sorry to disappoint you guys, but Axel isn't the first boss, and depending on who you ask, he's not even the second. But I get it, Axel's fight is spectacular and nostalgia blindness gets the best of us sometimes, no harm no foul. But let's not forget the actual first boss that walked so that Axel could run. Look, I don't care who you are, bashing away at a giant's head is never gonna stop being awesome. I still remember fighting this boss as a kid and thinking, why would I use reversal that just stunned the other enemies? And then I hit triangle by accident and oh, I'm fine, I'm getting closer, I'm smashing him in the face, oh, this is so cool! But that's not what makes this fight so awesome. See, before the fight starts proper, Twilight Thorn just kind of stands there. And before you can say, how do I hit this guy, the screen fades to white and you're suspended in midair, leaving you open for an attack. Unless, of course, you notice the flashing button prompt to perform an ACTION COMMAND! <laughs> hey, I told you, I call this the Shonen Anime Wet Dream for a reason. 
Also, did you know this guy has a desperation attack? I honestly didn't know that till I started writing this video. Look, dude, this fight's just a lot of fun. I'm trying to catch his face while it's wiggling around like something from the mask. Dancing around while taking down the little creepers it summons, and definitely one of my favorite things to do as a kid was to finish off the Twilight form with an action command for that epic final camera shot. Gotta get that dopamine somehow. <sighs> So, full disclosure. I only played God of War 3 one time at a cousin's house, so I've never actually finished the game. But goddamn, did that opening leave a lasting impression. Zeus's speech with the flyby shot of the underworld which then flies up Mount Olympus as the titans follow? God, what a spectacle. And that's before Poseidon comes crashing in with his seahorses and weird, crabby hands. Challenge me, mortal. A god of Olympus! Oh, um, before somebody asks me about this, I know that some sources claim that the Leviathan or Hippocampi is the first boss in the game. I don't agree with that. Actually, with how quick you can end the Poseidon fight, the fact that you fight two of these things, and the fact that these are literally coming from Poseidon. I'm of the opinion that these are actually more of a mini-boss. Maybe the starting phase of the Poseidon fight if we really want to stretch it. Back to Poseidon though, the dude's got it all. The crabby hands, lightning, and of course his signature trident. Oh yeah, you're also fighting him on top of Gaia. I feel so bad for her, man. I know this has probably been said a million times at this point, but the fact that the first thing you do in this game is take down one of the big three of the Greek pantheon, that is just hype. Plus, this fight has so many cinematics to help fuel that power trip, like the quick time event where you smash through Poseidon's defenses, followed by Kratos and Gaia coordinating an attack to force Poseidon out of his avatar, that is so cool, dude. And in a really nice attention to detail that I admittedly only noticed after stumbling upon a random YouTube comment, is that Kratos actually makes sure Poseidon's avatar falls because that's what got him killed last time. <laughs> then finally the battle ends with what may be one of the most brutal beatdowns in gaming history, through Poseidon's eyes no less. <laughs> oh, not anymore! Oh man, I should really look into finishing this game. You know, it's not every day a game kicks off with you slicing a kaiju-sized robot in half. But it's also just as rare to have your first challenge be somebody with actual character. Which is why I've grown to appreciate Major Ocelot over the years. Ocelots are proud creatures. They prefer to hunt alone. The Ocelot fight in Snake Eater may seem simple at first glance, but just like Ocelot throughout the series, looks can be misleading. While his cocky nature does tend to leave him open for attacks more than he really should, he's still got tricks of his own, like using ricochet shots to hit you from behind cover. And the more he gets used to his revolvers, the faster he reloads. This reload time is exhilarating. But what really lands the Ocelot fight on this fight is all the personality behind it. Dangling off the cliff and wearing ridiculous outfits will result in the Ocelot unit laughing at you. <laughs> Use a grenade and Ocelot will demand a fair fight. And in possibly one of my favorite interactions in the game, he'll cuss you out if you kill the Markhorn in the background. Son of a bitch! You can even challenge him to a duel by walking up to the edge of the cliff. Yes! It's the heart of a duel. And that's what I love about Kojima's game design. He understands that even the smaller details can make for a memorable experience. Let's just hope Konami learned that from him for the Snake Eater remake. You were lucky. We'll meet again. Alright boys, girls, and all else, let me take you back a ways. 
The year is 2011 and people are waiting in anxious anticipation for the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Oh my god, this is gonna be so epic. But oh no, it's not due till November 11th. Aw, oh, how am I gonna get my medieval fantasy fix until then? Enter Dark Souls, a much darker fantasy action game with tight controls, beautifully depressing scenery, and an absolutely brutal player versus player system. Which is why it's so unfortunate that the majority of people are only talking about the difficulty. I hate Italian. Well, I'm of the opinion that Dark Souls isn't actually that hard, I won't deny that there's some weight behind that belief. Dark Souls' idea of teaching the player is to continuously throw them at a brick wall until they can figure out how to break it by themselves. Take the opening, for example. After escaping your cell with nothing more than a broken sword, you'll soon come to a small courtyard where this thing just jumps down from seemingly nowhere and starts swinging its hammer around. Well, sure, you can try to fight back, but you'll rapidly realize that that's not a very good idea. So it's best to just run through the gate where he can't reach you. Well, that was anticlimactic. Or was it? Because continuing through the asylum circles back around to the boss room, and there's no escaping this time. But that's okay, you have proper equipment now, healing items, a better understanding of the game's controls. All we need now is patience, virtue, a bit of courage, and god damn fuck. It's fine, you can't get me up here, I'll just survey the area for my next attack, and get him when I'm good and ready, son of a bitch! Okay, maybe I can run to the other side of the room to study his attacks. He's big, that just means he's slow. Oh, fuck! I mean, he's still pretty slow, so maybe I can just hug his thigh. Wow, that's a sentence I never thought I'd say on this channel, and I'm dead. And congratulations, you just killed your first Dark Souls boss. I'll be honest, your life as a hollow is just gonna get worse from here. But I'm confident you can make it through. Now go forth and find light in this dark world. Try not to die too much. You know, when I learned that Yakuza 0 was a prequel highlighting the beginning of Kiryu's story, I'd expect the first challenge to be like a debt dodger or a low-ranking mook. Not a lieutenant from one of the largest Yakuza organizations in the series. Your first sign that this is no ordinary fight is that Kiryu doesn't take his shirt off. Everyone knows the best Yakuza fights begin with both participants ripping their shirts off for some bare-chested, bare-knuckle action. But that doesn't mean this fight's gonna be easy, because Yakuza doesn't screw around. It's pretty easy to get caught up in a power trip, too, after railing through all those guys from earlier in the chapter, before Kuze comes down on you with your 5am wake-up call. Ugh, five more minutes. The game at this point really expects you to have a full understanding of how your fighting styles work. When to dodge, when to block, when to punch, when to grab and smash his face into the wall! I know he used to be a professional boxer and all, but this is the first boss in the game, and he's got these quick, hard-hitting combos that can really do a number on you. Hit him too much while he's blocking and he'll counter off a haymaker. He can trip you with a leg sweep and stomp your face in if he really feels like fighting dirty. I even countered a 5 hit combo while I was gathering footage. This guy can be absolutely brutal to new players, but it's a nice little review of your skills and a bit of a tough love kind of test from the game. Yet another example of why I freaking love Yakuza. <coughs> I think you know the drill by now, here's some honorable mentions before we get to number one. Master Anora from Okami Din. A nice little fight to show you how multitasking with your partner is going to work, plus it's nice to see a boss actually try to adapt to your fighting style. 
Uh, he's using a clam for armor. How cute. Twin Bellows from Kid Icarus Uprising. It's no secret that I love Kid Icarus Uprising, and I've taken down Twin Bellows more times than I can count. Dodging him as he charges at you and shooting him as he breaks has yet to get old for me. But that's also on the higher difficulties after you've beaten him once before. The Parasite Queen from Metroid Prime. Weirdly a lot like Twin Bellows, but slower and stationary. Look, it, it makes sense in my head. The Gluttony Train from Bloodstained Curse of the Moon. It eats coal, it spits coal. Simple. And a good lesson on desperation attacks. The reason from Devil May Cry 5. You're not supposed to win this fight. But if you do, the game recognizes your skills and rolls the credits immediately, which I find hilarious. And finally, Komashita from Persona 5. Without spoiling too much, this guy's an asshole. So all the buildup of dealing with this guy's BS and finally taking him down is super satisfying. If there's anything I absolutely regret about that old list, it's that I didn't include Jean from Bayonetta anywhere. I'm not sure if it was because I didn't consider her a boss, or if I thought a different boss came before her, but... Past me is paying for it now, and I'm correcting that mistake. Leave it to Platinum Games to break the mold by introducing a rival fight as your first major challenge. Usually a rival fight is saved for a later point in the game to show that just because you've gotten stronger, that doesn't mean you don't have an equal. And Jean's basically a full copy of you, down to the wicked weaves and everything. She can even do those fancy afterburner air combos, so God, I'm getting Smash Bros. 4 flashbacks. There's two primary lessons to learn from this fight. Number one, witch walking. Since you've only got one surprisingly patient enemy to keep track of, you can get used to combat from different angles at your own pace. And two, witch time isn't always the answer. You can keep trying for that perfect dodge all you'd like, but time won't slow down for you. And if it does, it's not for very long. So, you're just gonna have to use all the other skills you learned along the way. It's a very straightforward fight, but she's as quick as you, strong as you, and a good warm-up for things to come. Which is why Jean comes out on top of this list. Thank you for watching me talk about the best of the first. Whether you've been here from the start or you're just tuning into this channel, each view is greatly appreciated, so let me know your thoughts on the list or video in general in the comments section, and as always, take it easy and stay positive.